Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, welcome to the Shanghai Lectures, welcome to the Global Virtual Lecture Hall. So as always, we will be calling on certain sites, but I would suggest that whoever would like to speak up, has a comment or a question, just speak up anytime. Uh, you don't need to wait for you know being called at. Okay, today's schedule, so we have... Uh, First, another winner of the Frame of Reference competition. Then uh, we had scheduled a presentation that, uh, uh, about Brain Innovat, that uh, they have some problems in connecting to the video conference. Maybe we will have that towards the end of the lecture. And then we will talk about collective intelligence. And then we have two highlights, two talks, uh, guest talks um, on uh, collective behavior and on the robot cloud. Okay, so let's start. This is the topic of today's lecture. But before we start, uh, may we have another <laughs> frame of reference competition winner. So it does pay off to actually pay close attention. I think today you're you know, out of luck because uh, it's pre-programmed that I will be talking about the frame of reference problem. But anyhow, so we have another winner of the frame of reference competition, Jan Gosman, again from the Humboldt University in Berlin. I don't know what that is, that they seem to be winning all the FOR uh, uh, awards. And uh, again, as last week, this will be presented by Professor Verena Hafner, who is the director of the uh, laboratory at the Humboldt University. So congratulations to Jan. Can we briefly switch to uh, Berlin? Okay, hi, Verena. Hi, Rolf, good morning. Hi. hi. So, <laughs> I heard Berlin is quite lucky this year. <laughs> so we have another winner and more Swiss chocolate. And the winner is uh, Jan. Jan Gosman. Okay, congratulations, Jan. That's it. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so he goes for the chocolate. You can either have chocolate or you can uh, go for a bottle of champagne. So he chose the Swiss chocolate, you know, who are, uh, which are considered by some people the best uh, in the world, best chocolate in the world. Okay, so thank you. Now, let's start uh, with today's topic. So, Woods still not connected, I guess. Is that right? Not on? Okay, so we'll do that later on because there is this interesting philosophical problem called the brain in event that you probably looked at. It was in the, in the slide materials from last week. We will have a presentation as soon as they manage to uh, master the technological problems with the connection, we will have a presentation from Woods on uh, Brain Innovat. Okay, but now let's start with the contents of the class. I will start with a short recap and then we'll move on to collective intelligence. So just to remind you briefly, in evolutionary robotics, there are different approaches. One, sort of the standard approach, what people do is, given a particular robot, evolve a control for this robot, typically a neural network, and we demonstrated how this can actually be done. Now, this is interesting from an engineering perspective, but it's not biologically very plausible, because in biology you never have an organism and then you grow the brain for the organism. But the brain and the organism, the body, they co-evolve over evolutionary time. And so we have the embodied approach, you know, like the... So we basically were interested in the embodied approach, where we have a co-evolution of uh, morphology and control. And uh, 
you know, the, basically the champion of, uh, the champion of, uh, of this who started this whole business was Carl Sims, actually a computer graphics, or he was interested in computer animation, not so much artificial intelligence. He just wanted to have cool animations. And then he came up with this idea of uh, evolving these creatures. And we posted a video. I think it's about a 12 or 14 minute video. That's why we didn't show it in class. But uh, I would highly recommend that you, you look at it. It's really fun to watch and it's very instructive. And he, so basically he evolved these creatures, core evolution of, of uh, body and control, and then he had a physically realistic simulation in which he tested his uh, phenotypes. And so, you know, you always have the you know, genotype, and then you have a process of development, and then you have the phenotype. Now, there's a later version of the Carl Sims experiments that we looked at, the Golem project by Lipson and Pollack, you know, where, where they had these you know, high claims that for the first time in the history of mankind, there has been a self-reproducing uh, robot, which, of course, was grossly overstated. But still, it's, it's a very interesting experiment. What they did, they added a 3D printing device to the end of the simulation, to the end of the you know, simulation of the evolutionary process. Now, this approach in Carl Sims, uh, that Carl Sims and, and Lipson and Pollack uh, chose, is called a parametric approach. Why is it called a parametric approach? Because you have, uh, if, you, if you look at this, you have, uh, you know, the robot is defined as bars, actuators, and neurons, and then the bars, in turn, they have a particular length, a diameter, stiffness, and so on. So basically, these are all parameters that evolution can play with. Now, I think that's, that's an interesting way of doing it. However, the limitation of this is that you can only evolve creatures or structures that have these specifications, you know, that consist of bars with a certain length, diameter, and so on, and actuators of particular types, but you'll never be able to evolve something as complex, for example, as a biological muscle or as a uh, biological organism, biological brain. This is why some other people have started looking more closely at uh, nature, like Josh Bongard, who used very simple models of genetic regulatory networks to, uh, to uh, model the process of ontogenetic development. And here you can see, so you basically have the genotype. If you start on the upper right, you have the, uh, you, have the uh, you start with the genotype, you have ontogenetic development, which in this case, you don't have, to, so the parameters here that evolution works with are no longer the parameters that describe the structure of the system, but the parameters of the genetic regulatory network, right? which are then transcription factors, for example, here are the transcription factors. And then you again have the phenotype with the physically realistic simulation. You have mutation, recombination, and so on. Right? And here, you had that in the slides. I'm not going to go through this, but this is just explaining in a bit more detail of what these models of genetic regulatory networks are about. Now, the question, of course, emerges, how far can we go with this? You know, if we use artificial evolution, will we all of a sudden evolve creatures that are going to be more intelligent than human beings, for example? I mean, that's a question that people often ask. Now, maybe we can briefly switch to Chiba. Is Chiba connected, actually? Chiba, yes. Yes. So would you uh, venture a statement on the limitations or the potential of uh, artificial evolution? Just some short comments. Uh-huh. Uh, about the simulation, actually, uh, there's limitation that we cannot predict every uh, condition, the, every real condition into our simulation. 
But uh, in the other hand, uh, using simulation, we can get uh, many kinds global information about uh, our simulation, like uh, precision and velocity. Every single object, uh, e each of object, we can get its uh, condi uh, condition. <clears throat> So I think that's actually a very good point. I mean, uh, of course, in a simulation, you only have what you actually put into it. You know, anything that you didn't put into the simulation is just not going to be there. Whereas, by contrast, you know, if you look at natural evolution, in the real world, there is always stuff around that evolution can basically use. You know, if you look, for example, at waste products in an organism, they can be used to transfer information like the hormone system, you know, which you, uh, used to be just waste products, but then evolution made use of it in terms of uh, an information network inside the organism. Okay, well, thank you. So I think that's uh, the, uh, the uh, recap from last week. Let's, let's now start with uh, collective intelligence. Now, I think what's, what's really important in collective intelligence, and that's something which I think we have to get used to, but because we're thinking about these issues, uh, we're already used to these concepts like self-organization. That's always something that people have difficulties with because it's self-organizing. You know, how do you control something that's actually self-organizing? It seems like a contradiction in terms. We will see that you can actually have something like guided self-organization. So we have a self-organizing process, but you can still add a bit of you know, control uh, to it. And that's an extremely powerful way of thinking about design. And you can have self-organization and emergence at various levels. You can have levels, the level of molecules. You know, molecules they just assemble. You know, nobody tells the molecules what they should do. You just have shape and charge distribution, and then they assemble into structures. You have cells, organs, individuals, individuals that interact, and we look at groups of individuals. And today, I think we will mostly uh, be uh, talking about individuals and uh, groups of individuals. Again, let me remind you of the uh, time perspectives in understanding and design. And uh, I think what's, what's being shown here in, in this slide, I mean, you remember the here and now, the here and now perspective, the ontogenetic one and the phylogenetic one. And then you never, we also mentioned that if you look at something like evolution, but also everyday life, we rarely have, like in this auditorium or in the global virtual lecture hall, we are many individuals that interact with the real world and with each other. And so we always have, I mean, if you look over here, we always have the perspective of collective intelligence, right? We would never have what we have in terms of social structure, in terms of technology, if it were not for collective intelligence. So I think it's an extremely important perspective uh, that uh, we should always we should always think about now if we think about design then remember state oriented we had that what we called hand design that's the here and now perspective learning and development there we define the initial conditions learning and developmental processes and the phylogenetic perspective so we define the this what we did last week evolutionary algorithms morphogenesis and if you are interested in understanding, you need always need to understand all three perspectives. You know, that's a comprehensive understanding of intelligence. At the design level, you need to talk about the level of designer commitments. You know, where do you design the system and where do you let the system evolve or develop by itself? In collective intelligence, we're interested in emergence from interaction. Okay, so there are many examples of collective intelligence. You know, if you take a beehive, there is no, you know, we talk about a queen, you know, in the beehive, but the queen actually has no, let's say, authority whatsoever, but it's a, it's a purely uh, self 
organizing process or take these constructions here. I mean, termites, uh, termite mound is an enormously sophisticated construction, but there is no architect, there is no blueprint of this. So how does it work? Or a wave in a stadium or now more recently, people talk about open source uh, communities and look at this in terms of, uh, of self-organization. Now we're going to look at self-organization and uh, groups of individuals. Now the question is, Christopher in Hobart, uh, could you, I mean, one important phenomenon that people have been talking about is how ants can find the shortest path to a food source. Now, this is a complex optimization problem in principle. Now, how come that these ants can solve a complex optimization problem? I mean, if you think about it, you know, ants would, would sort of need to explore the environment, find a food source, need to store the distance from the nest to the food source, then go to the next food source, try to find the next food source, explore, uh, measure the distance to the food source, compare the distances, and so on. So there's a lot of cognitive activity required. Now, how is it possible that ants can actually solve that? Can you uh, venture an explanation? The Tasmanian expert for um, ant navigation isn't here yet. Uh -huh. So, um, so uh, shall we... Uh, we, shall we Shall we do this later? I mean, or, you know, I... I we, we probably need to ask the global audience. Okay, okay. Would someone... Okay, that, I'm happy to do that. So would someone uh, uh, like to uh, provide an explanation of how it is possible that ants can actually find the shortest path to a food source without, you know, assuming that they don't have these cognitive capabilities, you know, of storing distances in memory and comparing distances and all that. Would someone else, uh, or maybe the local audience here in Zurich, maybe someone has an idea here? Or, you know, wherever. I think it's a really interesting problem how they solve it. I mean, it's sort of, if you don't know it, if you know it, of course, then it's pretty obvious. If you don't know it, it's, it's a very unexpected way in which they're actually solving this, this problem. Okay, any volunteers spontaneously? We have, a, we have a Tasmanian who would like to give a um, good guess. Okay, that's good. Go ahead. Okay, so um, this is purely a guess, but based on what I know of ant biology, even though they lack the cognitive capability to, to perform uh, pathfinding, every time an ant moves somewhere, they lay down a chemical trail that is used as a signaling device for other ants. So even though they aren't working together uh, and, and putting together plans, each of the ants has a, a small self-interested uh, element that says, I'm looking for food. If I smell food, I'll move towards it, and I'll lay down a path towards it. And eventually that system self-optimizes towards having a shorter path for all the ants. Yeah, I think that's, that's a very good point. So what they're doing is something very clever. They basically use the environment uh, by depositing these chemical trails, these fer also called pheromone trails, and then there is a certain evaporation rate. So these chemical trails, they also evaporate. Now you can imagine if there is a short path to the food source, the evaporation is less than if you have a long path to a food source, right? So when the ants return, so, the, where you, so when you have a short path to the food source, the pheromone trails will be stronger than the ones where you have a long path. And so if the ants have a simple mechanism of just following the strongest pheromone trail, then automatically they will find the path to the shortest food source. Yes. So I think that's a very clever way. And this is also... Uh, yes? And, and I think this is, uh, this is uh, an, an interesting way of exploiting, so sort of communicating with the other ants but not directly, 
but through the interaction with the environment. So by influencing the environment, depositing pheromones, then the other ants react to this environment. That's also called a stigmergic interaction. So let me just write this. This is an important uh, point. This is called stigmergic interaction. And it's an extremely simple but an extremely powerful mechanism. Okay, so thanks to Hobart. And here in the slides, I'm not going to go into the details. You can find more detail on how that actually works. Actually, humans, we always think humans are extremely superior to ants, but if you think about it, they're not so different, you know, how they actually solve problems. There is interesting uh, simulation software uh, uh, on the NetLogo. So there's this language called NetLogo. Uh, and here you find the link, and there you can find simulations of how this uh, actually how this actually works. I think if you if you like to play around with this, it's really instructive, and it's also a lot of fun. Okay. And the the language is is called uh, Star Logo here, Star Logo, developed by Mitch Resnick from uh, MIT. And by by the way, a delightful little book called Turtles, Termites, and Traffic Jams. Okay, now I will recall the notion of emergence. So we have three types of emergence. One is collective behavior, so we get global patterns from local interactions. We'll, we had the example of the Swiss robots, remember? Now we're going to look at bird flocks or, you know, clapping is another example. You go to a concert and then, you know, people applaud at the end and then, you know, almost certainly, you know, they start getting into a, a, a rhythm, but there's nobody sort of saying, now you have to do that, but it's a self-organizing process. So that's emergence or behavior. So emergent from interaction with the environment, Remember, puppy, right? So we have emergence there also. You cannot look at the control program and understand the behavior unless you understand the dynamics of the system. And then we have emergence from time scales. Okay, now recall the Swiss robots. So we had the Swiss robots, you know, and uh, so we identified this as a self-organizing process, emergence. So what was, what was the mechanism? What was the mechanism underlying the uh, Swiss robots, if you recall? Maybe we can have a statement from the audience here in Zurich. What was the mechanism there? How did we actually get the clusters? You know, with, again, without having all these cognitive abilities, but from by exploiting the interaction with the environment and the morphology. Would someone want to, or from the, from the global audience? I think that was a very nice example of, uh, also cheap, the principle of cheap design. Yeah, over here, I think, over here. Um, yeah, we had just two sensors at the left and right side, and they were pointing at an angle away from the robot, so uh, he was driving around um, doing nothing, but um, whenever a box was directly in front of him, he wouldn't see okay. it and push it, and so after some time, cluster was formed, were formed. Exactly, exactly. So that's exactly the mechanism now, uh, and that's how you get the clusters. You know, it's, it's extremely simple. Also, we, we pointed out that it only works if all the conditions hold, if the Cubes have the right size, you know, it's really an arena because if you don't have an arena, the robots will just go off and so on. But if the conditions hold, then the mechanism is extremely powerful, effective, and efficient. And now the question is, of course, can we say something about the real, real um, ants, the mechanisms in the real ants from this? What can we say, you know, from, can we, what can we extrapolate from the robots to the real ants? I think that's, you know, a question also of interest to uh, biologists. So I guess uh, 
what we can say is, of course, we cannot say that's how ants actually function as a biological system, but we can say, well, it's an in-principle demonstration that it could be very simple. Okay, now let me talk. So in, in a sense, we also, whenever you have a group of people, we talk about cooperation, right? Now, in a sense, uh, you know, if you look at cooperation, here, frame of reference problem, I mentioned it, so no chocolate, no champagne this week. So what do we really mean by cooperation? You know, is it that the, the agents themselves want to cooperate? They say, okay, now I want to cooperate. Or is it us as external observers and we say, well, they're actually cooperating. If you take the Swiss robots, so maybe, uh, maybe what we can do is uh, we can briefly switch to Osaka. Can we switch to Osaka? Someone around there? Yeah? Okay. Would, would, you like, would you like to comment on some of these issues, you know, to what extent you would be talking about cooperation if you look at this list here? Uh, I guess cooperation should not mean work independently. It should mean multi agents interact with each other and learn to predict what will they, the other do. Uh -huh. Then explore a more efficient way. Okay, now if you look at these particular examples, for example, uh, what we just discussed, how ants find the shortest path to a food source, are they cooperating? Um, uh, I think Swiss robots, they work independently, so I don't think they are not cooperation. Okay. But ants, ants they, I think they are uh, interact each other, so I think they are cooperation. Okay. Okay. Even though, I mean, you would call that cooperation, even though the ants themselves probably, most likely, don't know that they are cooperating. Right? So this, yeah. Would, yeah? so this would be the observer's perspective. Right now, if you look at the list again, you know, ants carrying a large object. So ants can carry really large objects. Would they be cooperating? Mm. Uh. I, uh, uh, <laughs> it's a difficult question, huh? It's a difficult question. Uh, uh, um, yeah, I go, ahead. go ahead. Maybe they are cooperation, but I think they are not interact with each other, so I think it, they are not cooperation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think you have a good point, that interacting with each other is a crucial aspect of uh, cooperation. Now, if you think about the object, the large object that the ants are carrying, of course there is some kind of interaction in terms of the forces that they exchange through the object, right? But it's maybe different from, uh, let's say, a team of humans playing soccer. You know, they also cooperate, but there is maybe a different level of cooperation. So I think we have different levels of cooperation. Uh, and if you think about something like the, the Shanghai Lectures project, we also all cooperate in this project, but maybe it's a different kind of cooperation than the ants depositing pheromones on the ground. Okay, thank you very much. So please think about uh, this, this idea of uh, cooperation and what we really mean by cooperation. I think it's an interesting also frame of reference issue. Now what I would like to do is look at a particular type of collective intelligence, namely swarm behavior and in nature, you find it all over the place. You find it in birds, in insects, in sheep, in fish, but also I think in human beings. Now, uh, there is, uh, the question is, 
How do swarms, if you look at a bird swarm, for example, how does that come about? I mean, is there someone, let's say, the lead animal saying, okay, now here's the swarm and you, know, you follow me and you form a swarm? Or is, are there, there other uh, mechanisms? Now, Craig Reynolds, I think he was also a, a computer graphics or computer animation person, he was fascinated by swarms, how swarms come about and, and up here you can see a, a bit, you know, uh, swarms going around obstacles. So he came, he came actually, he came up with a number of, uh, of rules, actually three rules, and here are the rules. So the first one, so, and the idea is that there is no lead animal, that each animal just reacts to its local environment, and then the global pattern of the swarm is emergent from these local interactions of the individual agents. So each individual agent is equipped with this set of rules. I mean, that's the hypothesis. So if you, if you look at this, then we have the first one, which is collision avoidance. Just avoid collisions. I mean, if you bump into others, you know, it's not going to be much of a swarm. And the second one is what's called velocity matching. So basically, you are flying in the swarm, and all you do is basically you adjust the speed and the direction in which you fly to the speed and direction of your neighbor or of your neighbors. And then the third one would be the flock centering, which means an attempt to stay near other flock mates. You know, so basically you, you try to, if, if you're at the edge, you know, then there is nothing on one side and then you would have a tendency to move to the other side. So basically you move to the center of the swarm and lo and behold, if you do that, then um, you get the swarm behavior. And this has been used, for example, also this type of algorithm has been used in many movies it's frequently used like uh, uh, Jurassic Park, for example. But let's now have uh, a short uh, video, not done. Can we have a video of uh, flocking behavior with these uh, rules? Ah, here we go. Now here there is a point. So there is some, some of the agents actually f trying to follow this point so that the swarm moves in a particular direction. But you also see that the swarm can go around uh, this uh, obstacle that we saw. So with very simple rules, you get you know, seemingly sophisticated behavior. This is a phenomenon that we have encountered many times as we went along. Now, again here, the frame of reference problem. If you had to simulate swarm behavior, how would you do it? You know, write a computer program to do that. Now there is uh, a situated versus a God's eye view. Well, what do we mean by that? The God's eye view is, you know, you're basically the programmer, you look at this from the outside, and then you can have the coordinates of each individual, you can have the direction of the flight, the speed of the flight, so basically, you have the God's eye perspective. You know everything. You have complete information about the system. I think that's the easy, that's the easy way of doing it. I think that's straightforward. Now, in the situated view, it's more difficult. It's biologically more plausible because we don't assume that there is this lead animal that tells the others what to do but it's self-organization, local rules, and emergence. And maybe we can briefly switch to a Shanghai, and you can give us some idea on implementation of, of uh, swarming behavior. Okay? Hello? Yes, hi, we can, can hear, you hear you. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, we think to do that, at first, uh, one of the group 
should have the ability to recognize the others of the same kind and get their uh, positions. And then uh, you should compare the positions of, the, of your neighbors now and then, and you can get the uh, velocity information. To, uh, to, get, um, to accomplish collision uh, avoidance, Avoidance, uh, you should uh, have some something like a uh, repulse between you or, or, or the group or, um, and uh, other objects. And if you want to uh, match others' speed or uh, velocity, you must uh, compare with your, the speed information with you and the others and try to change the velocity to the average velocity of the group. And uh, any of the, every one of the group should uh, get, uh, trying to get close with, uh, uh, to the center of the group. I mean, uh, by center, I mean uh, the place where uh, the group assembles. There are more, more ones there. And so that's it. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, you mentioned uh, a couple of interesting points. One is the, uh, maybe the microphone should be switched off. We got an echo, yeah, okay, thank you. So um, one was, you, you also mentioned that uh, they should adapt to the average speed or velocity of the, of the swarm. The question there would be how can you know about, how do you get the information about the average speed of the flock? I think average speed is something, average, can I, something. yeah, go ahead. You, oh, you mentioned that how can we get the average speed of the group? So uh, if we can see around, we can get the direction, uh, we can get the positions of the of everyone in the group. So we compare the the positions now and then, and with the information of the speed of myself, I can get the speed information of the others, and I can get the average speed of the group. With a local environment, but we have a statement uh, here from uh, uh, Zurich. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I think he was assuming that there was one lead animal and you have the uh, whole information about the group, but I don't think you need it actually because it should be sufficient that you have um, each individual that tries to optimize all the three rules and then all together it will match. So you have to look only at like maybe 10, 10 other animals or whatever around you, match the average speed of them and the average, yeah, velocity and then you can just adapt to that and I would model it like you have some energy function that you want to minimize using all the three arguments and then you don't need some control. The point, the point here would be that all you need is basically the low information about the local environment of each individual, how many that is, you know, maybe five, maybe ten, if you, it's always good to think of extremes. So if you think you have a very large swarm, let's say with, you know, a thousand or a million individuals, then of course there is no way in which you can have information about all the individuals. So it should be sufficient to look at the local environment. Now, an important point also, okay, I have to speed up a little, is that you need some kind of sensors by which you can experience the environment, right? This can be for typically vision sensors, but also birds can sense the flow of air, and this can also be from others, you know, caused by others in the swarm. So I think that's, uh, if you start thinking about implementing a situated perspective on swarming behavior, it gets very interesting, and I think much more interesting than if you just have the global perspective. Okay. Well, thanks very much for your statements. So let's move on. 
so there are many examples of self-organization and emergence in you know, biological systems, but also in human society. Maybe we can have a couple of examples just from sulfur. Can we switch to sulfur, or are they connected? Nope, not connected. Okay, well, uh, do we have some other examples from the global lecture hall? Just very, very briefly, not spending too much time on this. You know, if you, if you think about traffic jams, that's a, an example, or take something like uh, Silicon Valley, you know, you have some infrastructure that attracts other companies, and that again attracts, improves the infrastructure, that again attracts other companies, and then you get these positive feedback loops. Okay, then uh, one phenomenon that is, brief, uh, that is often mentioned in the context of self-organization is crowdsourcing. You know, is that emergence of innovation? So can something like innovation be an emergent phenomenon from crowdsourcing? Maybe we can briefly switch to Korea, to SKKU uh, in Seoul for a comment on uh, crowdsourcing and self-organization. Yes, hello. Hello, can you hear me? I, we can hear you very well, yes. Hello. yes. Okay. Uh, uh, I think uh, crowdsourcing is a distrib distributed uh, problem solving and uh, production model or process. And uh, the problems are broadcasting to an unknown group of solvers in the form of an open call for uh, solutions. Uh, crowdsourcing may produce some uh, solutions from amateurs or, uh, or volunteers working in their spare time, and uh, or from experts or small business. Um, users are motivated to contribute, contribute to the crowdsourced task by both interesting, interesting motivations, such as social contact and uh, passing the time, and uh, or by extinct uh, motivation, such as the financial gain. So, uh, uh, as to is it, uh, as to is this a swarm behavior? I think, yes, it is. So, that's all. Okay, okay, thanks very much. Yeah, so I think it can be viewed as a kind of swarming behavior. Maybe the rules are a bit different from birds, or the rules are different from, you know, ant, ant behavior and, and pheromones. Okay, well, thanks very much. Now, there's social, let, let me skip the social simulations. Let me now move to the uh, second topic today, the modular robotics, and uh, look briefly at the motivation for modular robotics. So, um, one idea is that if you change the morphology of a system, and we've been looking at that a little bit, if you change the morphology of a system, this also changes the functionality, the potential functionalities of the systems. You know, famous examples are like here we get the uh, the pufferfish uh, fugu, you know, in in Japan, which is also, you know, poisonous or if you don't prepare it properly. Uh, the Mtrain module that we'll look at in just a second, or what uh, Professor Hara from. Uh, Science University of Tokyo used to call morpho-functional machines, that is, machines that change their functionality by changing their morphology. So we get adaptivity through morphological change, and then we want to look at self-assembly, self-repair. And I think the level of abstraction that we're going to look at here is the modules that are interacting with each other. Let me just give you an example, then it's, I think uh, everything is, is uh, much clearer. So we have modules, 10 centimeter scale. They morph through local interaction, so no external intervention is required. The individual actions of the modules are centrally calculated by evolutionary methods, uh, genetic algorithms, and I think we can see that emergence, it's not emergence or not emergence, but emergence is always a matter of degree. Now, can we have the Amtrain video to get a better feel or intuition of Mtrain, yeah, okay, very cool. 
So you can see the individual modules there. Right. All right. So you can see the morphing, you know, how, how the creature, so to speak, is actually changing shape, morphology. And now this is kind of this inchworm type of locomotion. This was developed by Satoshi Murata uh, in Japan. Okay, four-legged creature. Okay, walking sideways. I mean, you have to imagine that it's pretty difficult to figure out how the individual motors in the modules actually have to move to get this kind of behavior. And that's why they use evolutionary algorithms to figure that out. Okay, let's see what's up next. Ah. All right, what's next? Ah, caterpillar-like uh, movement. So you can see it can actually morph into very different shapes and it can move in very different kinds of uh, ways. Okay, so I think we're probably almost done with this. Is there something else? That... Ah, and we got the snake-like uh, behavior here. Okay, not done, thank you, I think that's it. So now the, uh, so you saw, you saw the issues, and uh, so now this, this was basically, you know, you want to call that self-assembly. I mean, it's centrally pre-programmed, but then it's self-assembly in the sense that there is no intervention by an external person. Now, the next thing that I would like to, in the remaining few minutes that I would like to discuss with you, is when you have a collection, uh, when you have spontaneous structure formation and emergent functionality, remember that when you have molecules, think of the primordial soup, you know, the origins of life. So you have molecules there, and they assemble in particular ways. Nobody tells them, there's no control. You only have shape and charge distribution of the modules. Now, Shuhei Miyashita was interested in the origins of life, and he developed something called the tribolones. So these are lightweight swimming tiles, about three to four centimeters. They have a vibration motor, so, I mean, you can see that a little bit here. They have a vibration motor here, they have a magnet, and they, this is the water, this would be the water. So basically, they, uh, they, swim on, uh, they swim on water. And this is like the ceiling, this is like, uh, oops, this is like the, uh, when you have, uh, you know, the pentagraph, this is the pentagraph where they get the electricity, okay? So they can, they can swim, the, you don't need to put a battery on them. Now what he did, he developed uh, tiles, you know, with uh, different kinds of shapes. Here you can see like pizza, pizza shapes, and they assemble in particular ways. Now not done, can we have uh, the first video, the pizza self-assembly? Yeah, here you see it's almost the final stage. You can see these tiles swimming, driven by a vibration motor that only provides non-specific energy in one. Lo and behold, you get a pizza. 
So it's as if that piece wanted to move into the slot, but of course, you know, frame of reference problem, that's our interpretation, that's not the interpretation of others. So you get this spontaneous structure formation without control. Nobody tells these tiles that they have to assemble into a pizza. Now, not done, can we have the second one, the emergent functionality? Okay, now you see the structure has self-assembled and it turns, the whole structure turns, even though the individual tiles taken separately don't turn. So as they get together, there is you know, what's also called synergetic interaction. So the whole is more than the sum of its parts. It starts rotating. So this is emergent functionality. Now this depends on various factors. You can look at that in the slides. It depends on the energy, what kinds of self-assembly that you're getting. Now, I just want to give you a fun example demonstrating that you can, using self-organization or guided self-organization, you can actually get very interesting things. And this is uh, a um, self-assembled bicycle. A self-assembled bicycle. I think that's, uh, that's uh, pretty uh, amazing. So let me just, let me just briefly uh, explain how this, how this goes. So the way it is, so we got, this, we got the dish here. So this is the dish with the water. And this uh, yellow triangle here has a magnet and a vibration motor. Now the green discs only have a magnet. They are otherwise passive. They have no vibration motor. Okay, and then uh, let's. Uh, not done. Can we have the? Uh, can we have the video uh, bike four? Ah, yeah. Now he's putting the, the the white tile in there. It's got a vibration motor. It's got a magnet. Well, it does turn a little bit. Huh? And then you get the wall following, which is not programmed into the system. There is no microprocessor. Now he adds the two passive disks. They only have a magnet, but no motor. He switches on the motor. You get this. And then there is some disturbance for some reason. And and sure enough, you get the bicycle following the wall. That's a two times speed up. You get the bicycle follow. So it's a self-assembled bicycle. There's absolutely nobody telling these tiles how they have to assemble. So you get the structure of the bicycle, but you also get the functionality. I think it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, now, uh, the question is, well, how does this work? So can we briefly switch to Karlsruhe for a speculation on how this actually might work. Yes? Go ahead. Uh, I believe the triangle with a uh, vibration motor just moves randomly. Right. So um, as soon as it meets one of the circles, they obviously attach because of the magnets. Exactly. And then possibly um, when it has one circle on each side, it'll somehow vibrate in the direction of the circles. So it'll meet the wall. And then, because of the same vibration, um, maybe with the friction, it will make the, get the wheels turning, and then you get the bicycle behavior. Right. I think that's pretty much, that's pretty much how it works. So the, the vibrations from the triangle are propagated to the passive uh, green disks. And, I mean, I usually take this as an example of, I mean, there is often this discussion, why we build real robots? Why don't we just do the simulation? And then I'm sort of asking the question, well, I show them this video and they say, well, give me the simulator that will actually give you this, this uh, particular type of behavior. Of course, once we have the behavior, once we understand it, we can put that into the simulator. But I think it's important to actually build the real systems. Then we have a couple of uh, design principles for collective systems. We always have to think about the level of abstraction. We have to hear it's very important to think about design for emergence. You know, we've had that 
many times before, but we are not trying to sort of engineer the behavior directly into the system, but we sort of think about, well, what's the functionality that we want, you know, like the swarm behavior or the self-assembly behavior, and then we try to devise local rules of interaction that will lead to these global patterns that we want from the system, but from a process of self-organization. So design for emergence is extremely important. Then some of the, some of the design principles uh, we can apply from individuals, we can apply to the group. Take, for example, the parallel, parallel loosely coupled do you remember, huh? Parallel, loosely coupled processes, also subsumption architecture. So you can apply this principle of parallel, loosely coupled processes to collective behavior. You can look at the individuals as being the processes, you know, the parallel processes. And you can look, for example, if you take the ants with the pheromone trails, the stigmergic interactions, you can take the stigmergic interactions as the loose coupling between the processes. Namely, a coupling which is not direct, but which is through the interaction with the, uh, with the environment. You know, it's just as in the case of insect walking, where you have the different legs and they interact with each other through the environment not directly through the neural system. I think that's uh, an interesting uh, principle. And then, for especially relevant for cooperation or for uh, modular robotics, is this homogeneity, heterogeneity trade-off. Do you want to achieve everything with one type of individual? you know, just one type of ants? Or is it better to have several types of ants? Now, you can think, of course, in ants you have specialization. You have the warriors and then you have, you know, the workers. So some kind of specialization seems to be useful. If you think about modular robots, if you just have one type of module and one of these modules breaks, you can just use if you have a reservoir of modules, you can just use this module. The trade-off is that this requires a lot of energy, a lot of you know, design. You need you know, the power supply, you need the sensors, you need the actuators on each and every module. But then it's very flexible. If you have specialization, then maybe some modules only provide structural support. Let's say the modules at the edges are the only ones that have sensors. Uh, and you don't need actuators on all the modules, and not all need to have power supplies, you can make a much more efficient and cheaper structure. However, if one of the modules fails, you need to have a replacement which corresponds to this specialized module. Right. Now, of course, nature has solved this very differently. Nature has the genetic regulatory networks and the cells that can basically differentiate into any kind of cell, but that's a topic that would, you know, require, I think, uh, too much time uh, to do. Now, the assignments for next week would be, look, uh, read uh, chapter 7. You know, as I said, you know, many times we have very little time in the global lecture hall, so you need to do a lot of reading. Uh, we have some additional materials for self-study, and then maybe we can think a little more uh, about how you would design a simulation model of flocking behavior from a situated perspective. I think we had some excellent suggestions from Shanghai. Maybe we, you can think more about that also by including considerations of the kinds of sensors that you would like to use and think about the issues involved. You have a vision sensor. Using a vision sensor, how can you make an estimate of the speed and velocity of your neighbors? 
How would you implement, using vision sensors, the flock centering uh, behavior? I think uh, it's a non-trivial issue, but I think it's uh, interesting to think about. So this is the end of lecture seven. Uh, lecture eight will be about human memory. Now stay tuned for the guest lectures. So let me just uh, mention the guest lectures before we go, uh, before we take a, a short uh, five-minute break. So we have one guest lecture from Budapest, Istvan Haramati, and he will be talking about coordination of multi-agent robotic systems. So I think it fits perfectly with the uh, topic area that we have been discussing today. Of course, it would be interesting to exploit all this to design robotic systems, and especially it will be especially useful to uh, learn about um, to learn about how we can exploit local rules to get better performance in robotic systems. There is a second guest uh, speaker that, uh, from uh, Abu Dhabi, Nicolas Mavridis, from the Abu Dhabi campus of New York University. And this will be about the human robot cloud, so humans cooperating with the robots and robots you know, being connected to the cloud. I think that's sort of the future of, of uh, robotic scenarios of how robots will function towards situated collective large-scale human machine intelligence. Now, uh, uh, Nikolaos can't be here today in person, but there is a TED talk that he recorded that we now connected or linked to, the, to our webpage, and we would like to ask you to, to view this uh, lecture maybe offline over a uh, cup of coffee. And I think now uh, it's time for a break. Uh, we still have the presentation from ah, Wuch. And that, ah, okay. Oh, thanks for reminding me. Is uh, Wuch now connected? Ah, okay. Excellent. So, so let me see. Maybe we can... Uh, I think I had that at the beginning. So maybe uh, now we have this uh, presentation on the brain in a vat by uh, Wuch. Uh, and here's just a bit of geography, but maybe you can give a short introduction on the university. Uh, anyhow, so now maybe we can switch to Wuch for a short five-minute presentation on the brain in a vet problem, and we take a break afterwards. Yep, I will do so. So Wuch, you can uh, start sharing your screen in a moment. Okay. Yep, should be okay yeah. now. Should be okay. Okay. Right, we can see you. Okay, so now you can start sharing your screen. Yeah. And then we can see your slides. Ah, here we go. Right. Hello. Uh, hello to everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so uh, uh, my yep. name is Chris Go ahead. And, Go ahead. and I'm from uh, uh, Technical University of Luch side. And I would like to give a short introduction, short presentation on 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 Technical University of Lodge, and also give a very short presentation on brain in a, in a VET problem, right? Okay, so uh, Technical University of Lodge uh, is, uh, has basically nine faculties, and there is Faculty of Mechanical Engineering, there is Faculty of Electrical, Electrical Electronic Computer and Control Engineering, there is a Faculty of Chemistry, Faculty of Material Technologies and Textile Design, Faculty of Biotechnology, Civil Engineering, 
uh, also Faculty of Technical Physics uh, and uh, Organization and Management, and finally Faculty of Processes and Environmental Engineering. So that's a pretty big university. Uh, it was founded in 1945. And we, uh, there, there is uh, 267 professors, and together there is about 20,000 students. Well, so, so, and there is 36 uh, number of fields of study. So that's a brief, uh, that's a brief uh, characterization of, 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 uh, of, of this place. And now let me, let me tell a few words about uh, brain in a vet. Stop sharing the ratio. Stop sharing the ratio. Okay. Yes, sir. Share. And document. Document. And browse. On the right side. On the bottom. Browse. Tag. Pulpit to brain in a vet. Okay. We can now see. Yep. Very well. Yep. Okay. So how, how how much time I have for this presentation? Like five minutes? Five to seven minutes, yes. Five to seven minutes, yes. Okay. Okay, so uh, basically I, I would like to describe a brain in a vet problem. So this is a philosophical uh, and thought experiment. And the basic assumption is that somebody can take out the brain from the body and place it into an over another environment into another artificial environment, for example, some solvent. And uh, basically, uh, the idea is that uh, how to simulate uh, all inputs and all outputs so, so we can keep uh, this brain uh, in the state of its awareness. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this can be achieved. Basically, you know, uh, let us uh, let us imagine that a person wants to walk in a room from one point, from A point into B point. Then, uh, then it perceives. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, vision has certain vision of the situation and has certain certain response of of of, uh, of senses. Then it takes certain, certain walking styles and arrives to the point B. So, uh, so there's a sequence of inputs and characteristic sequence of outputs. So, so in order to maintain, uh, to keep the brain, uh, to understand in the, in, the, in the situation that it feels that it is in the real world, we have to characterize all inputs and all outputs in very realistic way. And, uh, and basically, uh, this idea goes much farther that, uh, that you know, we can imagine the whole civilization that, that, uh, that, uh, that suppose we live in a, in a massive hallucination and, uh, and, we are, and our world is driven by, by external, external environment uh, by other scientists or by God. So this this is this is basically um, I mean uh, this 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 thought experiment uh, shows uh, uh, shows uh, that the only real real uh, real thing is, is is human mind is human mind, and everything else is uh, is a sort of uh, mind's interpretation. So, uh, so basically, um, and there's there there's a bunch of, of examples in uh, in culture and in literature that illustrate this this problem. There is like famous Matrix movie, uh, uh, which uh, which uh, which uh, picturize uh, the situation. There's there's also like uh, Polish writer Stanisław Lem uh, book on future future food uh, about congress future 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 congress futuristic co congress and also uh, there is Alva Noah book mm -hmm. out of our heads so um, 
So basically, I want to underline that technically this issue of implementation of brain in a vet has enormous technical needs, and that's the only thought experiment, but this experiment shows what are our cognition abilities and how we can recognize the world we live in. Yeah, so that's basically the statement which I would like to do. Okay. Please give me some comments. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Right. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. I think, can you switch off the microphone? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Well, thanks very much for the presentation. I think what's really interesting about this is, you know, that you have to provide the right sort of stimulation. I like the analogy to the movie Matrix, you know, which is exactly this sort of thing. I mean, can you basically simulate, provide a simulated environment such, and the simulation is so basically close to what we normally experience that we don't even know whether it's a simulation or not. How can we know that, for example, here in this global virtual lecture hall, we're not simply experiencing a simulation, but that we're, that we're actually in the real world. So I think it's a, a theoretically, philosophically really provocative experiment and has inspired many authors, artists, and movie makers to follow up on this idea. Okay, thanks very much. So I think now, uh, not on, uh, uh, it's time for a break. Is that correct? Okay. Yes, we have a five-minute break, and then we have the guest lecture by Istvan Harmati from Budapest. Perfect. Okay, thanks very much. See you in a little bit. Okay, so thank you again, and thanks everybody in the global virtual lecture hall. Maybe not on, we can play the trailer.